I thank you for this invitation and I thank you that I get to spend the day here. I'm going to stay the day for this wonderful conference and hear all the lovely talks ahead of us. So if anybody has a particular interest, please come up to me at any of the breaks, lunch. We can chat together and, and talk more about it. So I'll start with a disclosure slide. Um, I have received an honorarium uh, on one occasion from Coloplast um, for speaking at uh, one of their national conferences. I've had expenses paid uh, to a conference to learn about their new uh, product called transanal irrigation, and um, I was provided with free supplies uh, to trial this. And I have been using it as well as other um, adjunctive techniques for neurogenic bowel management. So my objectives uh, are to uh, give you a treatment paradigm um, and to begin a discussion about some of the research opportunities and in particular the quality improvement initiatives that I think we need to undertake in this area. I'm not going to go over the detail of this slide purely to say it's in your handout. It's a complex neurologic system. There's an intrinsic pathway that sits within your gut wall that uh, controls your colonic motility, but there's then these extrinsic pathways, parasympathetic, sympathetic, and volitional. And they're all influenced by the level and completeness of spinal cord injury. So it's quite complex, and we have to assess and treat each person as an individual um, when it comes to neurogenic bowel dysfunction. We do talk, though, about two main types of neurogenic bowel dysfunction, upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. So um, on this slide, I've got the lower motor neuron uh, or areflexic bowel dysfunction listed first. So this is someone generally with an injury at L1 or below so that the um, sacral nerves have been damaged. So there, there are no sacral reflexes. Um, your typical things that we talk about using, like digital stimulation suppositories, don't work very well because they depend on those reflexes to be intact. And in the reflex or upper motor neuron type bowel dysfunction, again, T12 or above, so areflexic, generally L1 and below, reflexic T12 and above. There's no volitional control of defecation, but those sacral reflexes are still intact. So things like digital stimulation and suppositories will work. And I've just got a diagram to summarize that here. Um, it doesn't uh, project terribly well, but the bottom line is that with the upper motor neuron type bowel dysfunction, generally individuals struggle with constipation. And with lower motor neuron type bowel dysfunction, individuals generally struggle with incontinence. So those are the two main issues that we end up dealing with. So what do we do? Well, there are standard uh, neurogenic bowel dysfunction guidelines that were published by the Consortium for Spinal Cord Injury Medicine in the States uh, many years ago that are still used. Um, they're available for free download on the PVA website. Um, there's also, more recently, um, Dr. Cograve, um, who's from the United Kingdom, has uh, published on the, um, the website for the Multidisciplinary Association of Spinal Cord Injury Professionals um, Management Guidelines for Neurogenic Bowel Dysfunction. So if someone is interested in this area, they go into a fair bit of detail about actually designing bowel care programs. And also, it's excellent for those of you who are in healthcare delivery. Um, they go into what rehabilitation centers should be doing in terms of educating our peripheral hospitals, um, follow up of individuals. It's really quite a comprehensive document, and it's available free on their website. So we do that. Um, what happens when the standard, what we call conservative treatment doesn't work? There are some adjunctive treatments that we can use. One of them is transanal irrigation, and there is level one evidence. By that, I'm, I'm not sure if you're used to that language, but that's the highest level of research evidence that you can get. 
So um, it reduces the incidence of urinary tract infection and constipation and improves fecal continence. So it, it, the transanal irrigation can work for both individuals with upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron bowel dysfunction. Colonic irrigation is a bit more involved, and I've got some pictures um, that are in the handout to show you just the difference in the equipment. Um, there's level four evidence that it can remove stool from the colon. Um, electrical stimulation of the abdominal wall, level one evidence. Um, and uh, acupuncturists will tell you that there are uh, colonic um, meridians on the abdominal wall. So that makes sense, low risk, um, generally low cost. So um, certainly worth trying and we're trying it in, in my clinical practice. And then functional magnetic stimulation, which isn't generally available to most people. This is the equipment used for transanal irrigation. It's a one liter bag with a catheter with a balloon on it. It's, uh, you can see someone's hand in the, in the distance there. It's actually quite small and compact, fits into that little gray bag. Um, and it shows reasonable results, about half um, half to a bit better, half to two-thirds show improvement, both with lower motor neuron and upper motor neuron type bowel dysfunction. I'll show you some scintigraphic images as well. And there was also a cost-effectiveness analysis, so just in terms of healthcare delivery, it is cost-effective. Um, there are higher initial equipment costs, but uh, lower costs in terms of attendant care. Um, so the top two are in our scintigraphic images. So they give someone some radioactive dye that sits in their colon, in the fecal matter in their colon, and that's how these images are done. So the top two are a non-injured person. The bottom two are an individual with a spinal cord injury. You can see that on the right-hand side, which is your left colon, which is uh, the part that should empty, and it does fairly normally after someone with a so-called normal defecation. <clears throat> the individual with a spinal cord injury, it actually looks like there's more fecal loading in the left colon to me in that one. And this wasn't just a single study, this was several individuals that they looked at. So this is uh, with the transanal irrigation, which is called the peristeen. Um, so this is their before image on the left and after on the right, um, showing pretty good uh, emptying of the left colon. What about the colonic irrigation? Well, just in terms of uh, size, it's a bit more daunting. It's not something you can administer yourself. The transanal irrigation is something that if you have good hand function, you can do yourself. Um, and I'll just show you that the colonic irrigation comes with these two carts that are, the one on the nurse's left is filled with water and the one on the right is for the um, fecal matter and water mix afterwards. So it, not something that's easily done outside of the clinic setting. There is evidence that it's effective. Um, but again, because it's not widely available, it's, it's difficult to be practical. What about surgical strategies? Um, Dr. Furland did a meta-analysis um, and ranked these for us so that we've got a priority list and the MACE or the Malone Antigrade Continence Enema. Um, I'll show you diagrams of these or sacral anterior root stimulation colostomy or ileostomy. So this is the rank order of surgical interventions. If you're conservative management and then all those adjunctive techniques don't work. So the top left is the, uh, just a diagram, a schematic of the transanal irrigation. On the uh, top right is the mace. So they basically, a surgeon takes the appendix or, or a piece of the colon and brings a catheterizable stoma out to the abdominal wall. So the person then catheterizes that like you would your bladder, but you catheterize it and introduce um, enema fluid. So you clear out your colon from the proximal to distal. Problems with uh, strictures of the site. It's used a lot in children, but not very well in adults because of the long-term problems, needing reoperation and others. And plus, the other 
issue with it is that not many surgeons are experienced in it. The bottom left is the root stimulation and then colostomy or ileostomy. So what do we use to um, assess bowel function? I advocate the bowel function basic and extended data sets. Um, there are a number of different measures. Um, if you work uh, with, uh, in a GI clinic, they use a constipation score and, and a St. Mark's score. You can construct all of these out of the extended uh, neurogenic valve dysfunction set. Um, that's internationally available, the international data set for spinal cord injury. There are also some tests that we can do, total colonic and gastrointestinal uh, transit time, or right colon, left colon transit times. And we can actually do anal rectal manometry, much like urodynamics for the bladder. You can look at the um, function of those pelvic segments. How useful are they? We tend to use these for research purposes. Um, for clinical purposes, I do advocate the data set because it's helpful to follow patients, at least uh, the basic um, part of it. Um, but uh, these are more helpful for more involved cases. We don't get these on an average individual coming with neurogenic bowel dysfunction. They're, how they're doing clinically is much more important. So, um, as I mentioned before, we optimize uh, our conservative neurogenic bowel care and make sure that there's some education to go along with that because that's proven to help. And then we look at some of our non-surgical surgical adjunctive measures, transanal irrigation being the one that's probably the most practical and easily implemented. You do have equipment costs. I tell my patients, it's depending how many supplies you use, it's about three thousand dollars a year. Can be up to four thousand, um, but um, but it does work, and there are reduced attendant care costs and other costs with it. Um, and then surgical measures, generally as a last resort. I put this, uh, um, Dr. Colgrave. Uh, this is modified from her version. Um, this is a treatment paradigm where the conservative bowel management is the underpinnings and then we proceed through the treatment paradigm as we go. There are a number of research opportunities. Um, I, in particular, I'd like to point out some of the policy issues. Um, funding. Again, unfortunately, our representative from the Ministry of Health has gone. Um, but equipment funding is, is an issue. Um, it, it is prohibitive for some people. Um, I must say I've been fortunate in, in getting Coloplast to send me some supplies now and again that, that we stretch and um, use for people who are in particular need. Um, attendant care, uh, whose scope of practice is um, neurogenic bowel dysfunction. As soon as you go beyond the anal verge, there's sometimes some issues with um, training PSWs. In the UK and the continental Europe where they've used this a lot, there isn't issues um, with that. They've, they've been training family members and they've had good, uh, good experience with it. And then um, educating primary care uh, um, practices about this, and you'll hear more about that from Dr. McCall, I think. 